David Nyward, investigative journalist and author of Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump, and the newest book, Red Pill, Blue Pill, An Antidote to the Conspiracy Theories that Are Killing Us. Thanks for joining me today. Pleasure to be here, Juliana. It's you had this beautiful thread on Twitter not too long ago about this idea of waving the bloody shirt and talking about the January 6th insurrection, that that's basically um, what the Republicans are doing. Back on Jan, was it January 22nd, maybe February 20, somewhere in January, February, you predicted that their narrative would be that the January 6th insurrection was understandable and a needed and patriotic act because good Americans thought the election was being stolen. And of course, Antifa are the violent ones, not the peace-loving right. MAGA folks. And of course, everything that you predicted is exactly what's going on. Can you give us some historical perspective about this tactic that they're using? Sure. Well, and and remember the, the sort of the shoe that drops on that whole narrative is that the problem is that the uh, January 6th insurrectionists who tried to overthrow the government, the problem is the liberals trying to take advantage of that and, and make political hay out of it. That's the problem, right? You know, we, we, they're trying to, um, uh, yes. uh, they're trying to persecute these uh, ordinary Americans. That's that, and that was something Tucker Carlson did just last Friday, where he's he uh, or Thursday, I think it was, where he probably both Thursday yeah, and Friday. <laughs> he essentially identified, you know, after Biden's speech in Tulsa, he said, you know, well, he's targeting, you know, and Biden specifically said the problem is white supremacist terrorism. And Tucker Carlson said that means they're coming after ordinary Republicans, right? He uh, identified uh, Republicans. Like, no. Yeah, and, and this was this is part of the dynamic of the whole waving the bloody shirt trope, which is something they've got a lot of practice at because they invented it after the Civil War, and that's where the phrase comes from. Can you talk um, a little bit about the history of that exactly? Yeah. Give, give the history there for folks who are sure. Well, uh, so. Yeah, during Reconstruction, after the Civil War, immediately after, there was, you know, the, uh, there were a lot of people who uh, went down from the north to um, uh, to the south to try to uh, make Reconstruction happen. And a lot of these, these folks were um, school teachers, and uh, some of them were people who went down and invested in uh, former plantations to try to make them working farms. And, and yeah, some of them, there were some opportunists, no doubt, uh, among these people, but uh, there was also a lot of, there were a lot of folks who were sincere and, and particularly the ones who were trying to educate black people. Um, and these people were called carpetbaggers. And, you know, we know that trope from Gone with the Wind, right? Mm -hmm. The carpetbaggers were the bad guys who were trying to exploit the poor people of the South who just happened to have been holding people as slaves prior to the <laughs> war, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, that was, that was the story in, in Gone with the Wind, right? And... Um, <laughs> That's but, it. Yeah. yeah, it really was. I mean, Gone with the Wind, the book, is really an encomium to uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, and the whole uh, white reaction against, uh, Southern white reaction against Reconstruction. And waving the bloody shirt was a phrase that came out of that. Uh, a, a school teacher uh, who was teaching black kids in, uh, I believe it was South Carolina, um, was... Uh, called out by, he was visiting some people and was, they were visited by the Klan that night, uh, night riders, you know, with their faces covered. And um, not cowardice at all to have their faces no, covered. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, burning torches and all that sort of thing. And they uh, called this guy out of his uh, host's home and uh, beat him bloody. Uh, they gave him basically a hundred lashes with a whip. And uh, uh, it didn't kill him, but uh, you know, basically, they were sending this message to white people who were trying to help black people, and and, and this happened a lot. 
in the South. This was happening to a lot of uh, people who were uh, down there to try to to help. And uh, I read, I read quite, in, quite in your piece that one of the reasons that they would target um, school teachers or principals is that schooling black children threatened to overturn one of these core myths of white supremacists, which, by the way, I believe uh, has lasted throughout this you know, the uh, yeah. up until right now that, you know, blacks are, were naturally ignorant, quote unquote, and too stupid yeah. to be teachable and they needed to be under the control of white masters, et cetera. I, wa I wonder how yeah. much that plays into the undermining of, of our public schools. But and that's a possibly a separate. No, it's very much part of the same mentality. I mean, it, it, a lot of the, the post, you know, post or the Reconstruction era uh, attitudes were. Uh, have been handed down to us uh, to this very day, as you'll see, I mean, or, or as we know from, you know, the whole waving the bloody shirt shirt. So, so this, black this, this, this beating this poor person, yes, white person. I'm yeah. Excited. It was a white uh, person, right? It was a white guy, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, yes. And uh, his, uh, when, uh, you know, there, this thing made me news, uh, or this incident made news. And a member of Congress from Massachusetts uh, stood up in the House and made a speech, uh, you know, basically decrying uh, white violence against, uh, you know, blacks in the South during this period. And the myth began to spread that he had taken this teacher's shirt, the school teacher's shirt, and waved it around on the floor of the House. Um, and of course, uh, he hadn't, but this myth persisted and it was like he had, you know, <laughs> um, he had broken some kind of taboo in doing so. Um, I was just thinking that that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. though he yeah, and a lot of this is in a terrific uh, a book of uh, history about the uh, Reconstruction period called The Bloody Shirt, Terror After Appomattox by a historian named Stephen Budiansky. And uh, he really lays out, you know, how the whole myth of, um, I mean, of <laughs> this bloody shirt waving became just this chief talking point. Um, and what happened was that if any northerner happened to bring up the campaign of lethal terror being waged against blacks in the South and any kind of political context, uh, he would be dismissed as waving the bloody shirt. And yeah, became, making like making. I love what was what Budinsky said, and you 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 put it out in your piece is that it made a victim of the bully yeah. and a bully of the victim. But the yeah. atrocities that these people were committing, they never took any responsibility of that. It's just, uh, right. and we're seeing this all over the place right, right now. Right. It was, it was never as Budiansky says, says the real story it was never the atrocities that white Southerners committed, but only the attempt by their political enemies to make, political hay out of it. I have this and, quote from that piece that you um brought brought up that I'd love to share. I'm gonna try to share the share the um where did it go? I'm gonna try to share the screen and so everyone could see it. There it is. Okay. This right at the top, I pulled this right out of your Twitter feed, um, which I suggest everyone follow David Nyward on Twitter. It's at David Nyward. And by the way, I'm happy to see that you're back on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I believe there was a Twitter throwing off at some point. There is a there is a three-week uh suspension. Yeah, because I put the cover cover of my book in the uh <laughs> see see those uh Little white uh, uh, stars in the background of my book. <laughs> oh. Those are those are clan hoods, and uh, oh. uh, it was they, part they of accidentally the, thought you yeah. meant it for real. Yeah. yeah, that's nice to know that Twitter's actually on the lookout for the clan. I I just <laughs> I got turned in by a white nationalist. Is what happened. Oh, they're just... like this guy's using our. Oh, it was like a, a copyright infringement. He was just trying to own me, yes, and and uh, he succeeded uh, thanks to Twitter. But you know, I think Twitter's been actually acting in good faith and trying to figure this stuff out, uh, unlike well, Facebook. So this 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 piece this I pulled this right out of your um, your your tweet 
um, thread, a footnote, but a telling one, I'm reading right off the top, to white conservative Southerners, the outrage was never the acts they committed, only the effrontery of having those acts held against them. The outrage was never uh, the manly, quote unquote, inflicting of well-deserved, quote unquote, uh, punishment on pulled troons. I'm not sure what... Okay, only the craven and sniveling yes. whines of the recipients <laughs> of their wrath. Um, I, that's exactly, you know, they're calling liberals snowflakes. They're, yeah. <laughs> it's the same deal. They're, it's the yeah. same thing. Like, oh, you guys are just whiny babies, as if whining is worse than beating someone to death. Right, or attempting to stop the peaceful transfer of uh, power in the United States and in our democracy, but and, and you know, it's it's just uh, rhetoric designed to cover the fact that they these people are fundamentally anti-democratic. I right? think they were right about if people don't know this history, they won't recognize this technique, and then they right. will possibly fall for it. And here we are. So, well, yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of people in, in, in media positions of responsibility who are falling for it. Let's be clear. You know, yeah. this is this is stuff that's showing up in New York Times and down you know, CNN, you know. So uh, and of course, on Fox News, because that's what they specialize in and they have for some time. I mean, we, we've seen this uh, rhetorical trope, this technique, the sort of gambit, as it were. Um, be it's had a long life and we i mean think about how in 95 after oklahoma city happened uh rush limbaugh uh uh you know bill clinton said well we have some divisive voices in the country that are raising a lot of hate and and that and and rush limbaugh claimed oh he's he's claiming that i'm responsible for <laughs> uh uh, Oklahoma City. It is like, well, no, not exactly. But uh, now that you say, <laughs> but, but, but this became conventional wisdom. I mean, Ann Coulter uh, kept saying, I mean, it became. What happened to her? A I haven't trope. seen her in a long time. <laughs> well, I, well, I would hope her uh, <laughs> political fifteen minutes are over, but yeah. who knows? Um, yeah, you know they, the the. Um, the it became conventional wisdom on the right that oh yeah uh, liberals and Bill Clinton blamed Oklahoma City on Rush Limbaugh, or blamed Rush Limbaugh for Oklahoma City, and and we saw the same thing in two thousand nine when the uh, Department of Homeland Security put out a uh, a bulletin warning that there were uh, there was a high likelihood that you know right wing extremists organizations not only are going to become more active, but they're going to be recruiting our veterans, uh, targeting veterans for recruitment and that sort of thing. And that's report, of course, that bulletin proved to be perfectly accurate. But uh, there is this huge uproar where they said, you're, you're, you're uh, planning, to, you know, they're planning to target Obama's planning to target these um, uh, nor normal conservatives for, you know, <laughs> because... Who are just uh, taking up arms against the government in a few years. Right, right. Well, uh, and that was the thing. Um, you know, it really gave cover for people to keep organizing in this way and um, sort of these movements to not only keep going, but to gain strength. Um and what, what, particularly you, you because you just answered the question I was just going to ask you, but I'd like you to go a little further on it. Like, what role does this particular technique have in um, uh, inciting the fascism that we see on the march here in the U.S.? Well, right wing extremism and, and uh, the sort of author authoritarian mentality behind it uh, really depend on. Uh, first of all, it was a, a heroic self-conception. Uh, they always see themselves as heroes who are going to be saving America from whatever the uh, threat is. And the threat is really the key because most of the time, uh, what one of the real enterprises historically of right-wing extremism is creating enemies, sort of fabricating them out of frequently whole cloth or tiny little snippets of reality, uh, such as what the John Birch Society did 
with uh, the supposed communist threat in the 1960s and 70s and spinning it up with conspiracy theories into this great existential threat. We've seen the same thing happen with Antifa and Black Lives Matter as being, uh, as this is a trope that's been generated on the right in the last three, four years as this gigantic existential threat to America. And it's a lie. I've been out covering these street events with the Proud Boys and these other groups that are battling Antifa, anti-fascists and others. And I can tell you that the threat is not those uh, black clad people. Aren't any, isn't anyone who, who wants uh, democracy to continue technically anti-fascist? So, yeah. well, <laughs> I yes, mean, yes. your mom's Antifa, really. Yes, yes, uh, technically so. But uh, on the other hand, I don't want to, I mean, there is an anti-fascist movement that has very a uh, specific sort of ideology, and, and this involves, uh, their ideology really involves direct confrontation and undermining of fascist elements whenever they poke their head up, which is different than being, I think, a generic anti-fascist. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, so the, the anti of <laughs> Yeah, because, because ultimately, yes, if you're a, a Democrat, if you're a person who believes in democratic principles, you're generically anti-fascist. Uh, but anti the anti-fascist movement, the Antifa that they're talking about, is a, a discrete movement that has a, a, def, a very clear ideology. How many? Um, well, let's talk numbers in, in relation to the, uh, to the uh, different groups, the Proud Boys and all these different people who have all these people in the groups. How many numbers are we? What's the percentage? How big is one compared to the other? Well, as far as I can tell, the anti-fascist, the Antifa movement, as it were, uh, really is mostly relegated to a handful of urban areas with um, uh, very with highly educated. I mean, a lot of this comes out of kids going to college. Uh, is that's where the black bloc uh, folks originate, and a lot of, and that's where what we're seeing is that black bloc sort of joined forces with Antifa, and then that's when we started seeing this sort of um, the, 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 some of the violence that, that came out of Antifa. Um, and, but it was very slight. Uh, their, their ideology isn't specifically geared to uh, creating violence, but it's here, what they do say is that they will use violence to defend their communities against violent actors. Um, which is a very different thing than what the Proud Boys and these folks were doing because I was hanging out. That's who I was hanging out with during these protests. And it was very clear that those guys, I mean, first of all, none of them, none of, when you go to a, 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 a Proud Boys rally or, or Patriot Prayer rally in Portland or Seattle or San Francisco or, you know, Berkeley, uh, these people weren't from Portland or Seattle or Berkeley. They were from the hinterlands usually, often, you know, the exurbs or rural areas, sometimes the suburbs. Um, but they were people who were coming to these cities to, with the specific intent of creating violence. And that's what they were about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, yes, anti-fascists showed up to stop it, to uh, meet them because they were because they knew they were intent on creating this violence. And of course, the, the story that got told on Fox News was that uh, the anti-fascists were the ones creating the violence. And that simply wasn't the case. Did you um, see that um, whether the other news networks actually reported it accurately or did they kind of jump on the bandwagon of, uh, you know, making, making, making news hay? I, I, the large media definitely did the latter. The local media did a fairly good job of, of covering these events accurately, particularly, you know, outfits like Oregon Public Broadcasting did a terrific job. And I used to be on this. there. Did you? It was you one of my really? first, uh, co co you know, communication uh, forays, yeah. yes. They, they did a terrific job. Willamette Week has done a, a very solid job of covering this stuff. Uh, Oregonian, eh, <laughs> the off and the on. The bigger uh, you get, the farther yeah. away from the people. 
the more advertisers, the well, uh, far, the farther the message gets from perhaps well, reality. Well, right. The, what you know, most of these larger operations, and because especially the journals who had parachute in and just get you know, oh, let's get some quick shots, and and of course they go to the burning buildings because that's that's what they're showing, and so. The, the narrative that got built, especially last summer, was that all these cities are burning down and, and they're just Antifa is destroying America. All the, and you know what? They, there were a couple, a handful of artisans um, that got, who the footage got shown and reshown and reshown as uh, this as emblematic of what was going on in these cities. And frankly, with the, the aspect of this, they got completely omitted in most of the national coverage was the role of the police in causing this violence because the police uh, were using uh, extremely aggressive tactics that were totally inappropriate to these circumstances. And people were responding violently to the aggressive tactics, which is not surprising because that's what happens when you use aggressive tactics. And that's why, and, and in fact, most police organizations have, uh, you know, or people who study policing have been arguing, uh, recommending, you know, uh, totally different tactics. These are tactics that have been dis were discredited by the late 1970s and yet have remained in use in these police departments. Mm -hmm. And so that was, and that was really a, a significant part of the, the dynamic that we were seeing last summer. So, yeah, um, you know, they generated this whole, myth of uh, American cities burning down. <laughs> I live in Seattle, so, you know, it's, uh, I can tell you, we did not burn down. <laughs> mm -hmm. There, the, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I live yeah. in a small town, I'm not gonna say which one, in the Northeast. <laughs> North, you, if you look at the town that I live right outside of, it looks like it's been burned down. And that is because all of the manufacturing jobs that used to be in these different, um, yeah. uh, warehouses and, and, and factories are gone and the factories are falling in on themselves. And it looks like, you know, uh, something yeah, horrible happened here, but yeah. more yeah. destruction is happening because of economic policies from the right than, you know, Antifa yeah. maybe set fire yeah. to a yeah. yogurt shop. Well, yeah. And, and of course, uh, it, that's, we, we could talk all day about that. I, I honestly think that a lot of the gutting and manufacturing was something Democrats are completely complicit in. But <laughs> no, I would never disagree with you on that. Yeah. I, I've said before on this program and in other programs that I blame uh, NAFTA, which was yep. happened under Bill Clinton, uh, for the death of my father because he worked... Um, you know, in that kind of environment and the jobs just kept going out of him, out of him, out of him. He would get depressed and one thing leads to another. He didn't kill himself, but you know, these, the stress, stress of not being yeah. able to provide takes a real toll on a, on a person's life. He should be still alive now. I have been without him for about 20 years. Yeah, it's tough. Um, well, yeah, I, the, the stress is uh, that, that happened and, and it has, that actually has a lot to do with why people are so susceptible to authoritarianism as well. Uh, and that's really the underlying thing that I keep seeing is, you know, I don't know if it's fascism specifically um, that we're seeing, uh, but we are, there's just unquestionably in my mind, just this real strong incoming tide of authoritarianism um, that appeals to people on, on, in their lives and makes sense to them in a way that, that, yeah, it, it makes them eager to uh, abandon democracy. And this is especially true for Republicans because I think Republicans and conservatives are realizing that they will never have a, a majority or a large enough, even plurality of support from voters in this country to enact their agenda. So they believe that they're really reaching the point where, well, they're giving up on democracy because they don't think they can achieve their ends uh, through democratic means. So yeah, they, they'll, they're resorting to authoritarianism and that's really a lot of what we're seeing here. David, what what does make people want an authoritarian leader? Are we just, are people just fearful? I know this yeah. area where I live, they were working class, mostly Democrats. As those um, jobs started to dry up, they were left ripe open for uh, demagoguery and, and it went red. 
Yeah, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. Fear is one of the things. One of the interesting things about authoritarianism is, you know, it, it kind of exists naturally uh, within every population. There's always X number of people with authoritarian personalities. Uh, and it usually is, you know, down around the 20% range of the population. But you can actually increase authoritarianism by generating a, a sort of authoritarian responses doing, you know, psychological uh, 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 tactics. And the number one aspect of that is fear mongering. And, and I actually believe that we really, I started seeing um, a real increase in authoritarianism in American politics uh, after 9-11, uh, when we were just drowning in fear mongering and con a constant st drumbeat of fear. And, you know, five years later, it, it shifted to immigration where we started getting a drumbeat of fear about uh, immigrants coming over the border. And that really became the more, the more long-term thing. But of course, Muslims and Al Qaeda, and that became, was all mixed in with this drumbeat of fear. Um, but yeah, I think that that was when I started seeing uh, Republicans and the conservative movement really become uh, mm -hmm. distinct, uh, moving towards authoritarianism. That was really the subject of my 2009 book, uh, The Eliminationists, uh, How Hate Talk Radicalized the American Right. And that was, you know, what I was really describing there. And, and I discuss it was, you know, the, 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 the structure of this drumbeat was fully authoritarianism. And uh, and I warned in 2009 that, you know, we're going to, we're likely to see a kind of proto-fascism uh, as long as this drumbeat continues. And of course, what happened was it got even worse with the Tea Party during the Obama years. And, um, uh, and that was when I, I really think that the, the, radical right became mainstreamed into the Republican Party. And that brought us Donald Trump. <laughs> Holy. David, you're also the author of Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump. And now that we're in the, I'd say, well, we're not exactly post-Trump, but we're post-Trump presidency. Um, there hasn't been a lot of reporting on what's going on, on you know, are people still joining that movement Are what, you know, is it yeah. still growing and growing at exponential rates, which is basically yeah. what people are. Yeah. It's, well, I, I, I do think January 6th put set people back on their heels quite a bit and made them kind of go, Whoa, this is where this is going. Uh, and hopefully there was some peeling away as a result of that but what we have seen uh in the months since january 6th really is uh, an intensification of the radicalization process where people are just saying no we're, we're you know they instead of backing away and and recognizing that that they're um you know going down a, a road of that's going to be that's going to destroy democracy they're doubling down, and you really can see this in the Republican Party with, you know, members of Congress saying, "Oh, that wasn't an insurrection. <laughs> that was that was just a protest that got out of hand." You know, they, they all of those crazy guys. You know, yeah, they did some crazy stuff like smearing feces on the wall, but but you know, it was <laughs> but, and threatening. You know, coming in, planning to. Hang your fence and that sort of thing. But hey, other than that, you know, they were just good Americans. You know, that and that's of course the narrative we're getting from Tucker Carlson and all these Republicans. That well. guy's gonna go down in history as like, you yeah. know, the Goebbels of <laughs> of uh, of this yeah. current age. I mean, oh mm -hmm. God. Your recent book, which was very helpful, pal, the right? most recent pal one. Glenn. Right? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm Kevin is pal Glenn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah. You're, anyway. You're, the most recent book you have is The Red Pill, Blue Pill, An Antidote to Conspiracy Theories That Are Killing Us. Yeah. What are the antidotes? I mean, we're having this conversation. Mm. Hopefully, we'll reach as many people as Fox does in one night. But, you know, if well, those of I, you who are watching will share this, that would be helpful. But, uh, you know, how are, what's the antidote here? 
Well, there isn't. <laughs> That's oh, the your book is blank. The, you open it up. <laughs> Actually, what I explained in the book is that if, if it would be wonderful if we could make it that simple, you know, where people who are red pilled could we could just hand them a blue pill and boop, and their scales call, fall from their eyes. But life's not that simple. Uh, it is possible to de radicalize people and pull them out of these uh, rabbit holes of of unreality that conspiracy theories create. But um, but it's actually a really hard process. And it's uh, not something that happens easily. There are things we can do as a society to uh, cut down on uh, its spread and the, and the extent to which it's, it's spreading. Um, but the actual solution of getting people to uh, wake up and, you know, realize that they've been radicalized by an extremist movement um, is very, uh, it, it really takes, what it really takes is one-on-one -on -one, uh, contact over a period of time, usually months and years of uh, spending time with people who have been radicalized into conspiracy theories and pulling them gradually and slowly back to reality. And it, it only works with people who you have an actual personal relationship uh, with, and it um, it's a very fraught enterprise. But you know, I I also know from having done this work for a long time that that a lot of people, particularly family members and close friends, who are really deeply concerned about these people, um, for them it's worth it. So that was why, uh, and you know, I've heard from de-radicalization experts and therapists that, oh, well, you know, putting a bunch of amateurs out, you know, how, giving advice to a bunch of amateurs to try to attempt this is probably a bad idea. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I just felt compelled to give people tools that they could work with uh, to help pull people out of the uh, alternative universe that uh, I find that just walking creating. around and being nice uh, when I'm with my radicalized, uh, you know, family members right. uh, is mind blowing to them because what they're being told on the news is that liberals and progressives are eating babies and they look at me and they're like, she's having lasagna. You know, they're not, they oh. see you as a human being being a human being. And, and that's great because that's actually one of the things that I think that liberals and uh, progressives uh, really need to figure out is that we we respond to these things by going, uh, trotting out facts and logic and going, oh, but look at this, you know, and this stuff never works because they have bought in on a gut level to a narrative that, that does see you as part of the conspiracy. And ultimately, yeah, I mean, the, what the message is, is that, and one of the reasons it's so hard to break through is that they really see ordinary people on the left and, and in even moderate liberals like myself as, as deeply, profoundly evil. And, yeah. and, 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 and this is one of the things that we're really bad at. You can is, see, I can see it in their face kind of going like, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, <laughs> and that's that you could possibly be, you know, and, and, and that, that, is, that is the narrative we need to be hitting that, that instead we, we need to stop trotting out facts and logic and reason and just start saying, Hey, do you really think I ate babies? Come on. Yeah. You know, I mean, just talk to them on a common sense level, get to their gut level and just get them to realize that you're talking about ordinary, normal human beings who just see the world a little differently than you and have different answers. They're not eating babies. They're not the essence of evil. We're not creating demons and what have you. I mean, it, it, this is... I think you're right. I think that's what works. We, it does. It, it certainly is a, a foothold in that, that, you know, let's get back to uh, some reality here and, 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 and talk to people on a real human level instead of responding um, you know, sort of, you know, trying to be logical about it. Don't try to be logical about it. Be, be human about it, mm. you know? Uh, and, and I think that's far more successful in, in blunting a lot of this, I mean, yeah, I, one of the things, I mean, as you know, one of the reasons that I uh, have some ability to attend 
or to cover right wing extremists is that I look like them <laughs> and I grew up among yeah. them. So I know what they talk about. You can I know blend. How they yeah. I, I blend. I'm a schlubby white guy, you know, I blend right in. And, and I know how they talk and I know how to talk to them. Right. And one of the things that's always been interesting to me is that, that they will, um, you know, I, I, I will sit and have these conversations with them sometimes and, They'll they'll go oh well you know you're you're not one of the evil liberals Dave you know we understand that. you know it's like well, but nobody is. Yeah, right. you have this you have this big boogeyman built up in your mind by Alex Jones and and Fox News that just isn't real you know and and they usually take sort of take that under advisement because I'm only this is I, I, these are just guys I'm talking to that day and yeah. I don't usually get to know them very well, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's, I, I want to hit two more points here and sure. I know, and I appreciate your time. I know we've gone a little over the time that I booked you for. And I, again, I appreciate your time. First, how does it feel to be right? Because when you first started this reporting, people were like, okay, it's just a little thing. It's not a big deal. And you were like, this is going to be a big deal. And yeah, here oh, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, don't, as you know, I had quite a few years of being dismissed as an alarmist about this. Yes. And all I was honestly really doing was just reporting what I was seeing on the ground happening and trying to report it accurately and truthfully. And people being, and, and, and yeah, I was analyzing it within a, what I thought was a pretty rational frame, but, but people, because the conclusions that I reached, namely that we were heading towards a sort of proto-fascist uh, uh, future, uh, that people went, "Oh, whoa, whoa, we, we can't use the F word. You know, we can't, we can't go there. You know, we're good with you up to that point. You know, and it, and so, oops, here but, we are. <laughs> but but I got to tell you, Juliana, it does not. Uh, it, it, it makes no, it's not satisfying to be right. It no, really is of not. It's, but it is really, been, I, I, I do want to satisf- give you credit for having to live through um, yeah. the sort of uh, marginalization of some of your work, saying that you were an alarmist and, and, and we need alarmists because alarmists set off the alarm. That's how you know the house is on fire. You know, well, yeah, I mean, they can be wrong. Uh, that's the thing is that, that, you know, there are alarmists who, you know, <laughs> I mean, let's be clear, the QAnon folks are, are, are radical alarmists. They're, true, saying, true. they're saying Democrats are eating babies, but, true. but you know, um, <laughs> right. Well, and, alarm, and that's, an alarm that's useful, I guess. I yeah, think. yeah. Well, you know, Cassandra was Actually. the uh, prophetess in Greek mythology who was cursed by Apollo with the gift of uh, future uh, <laughs> foresight and and but uh, she was cursed because uh, he cursed her with the, the fact that no one would believe her, right? Her yeah, and so. every other woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. There's another yeah, so, you know, when she warned the Trojans about that Trojan horse, they ignored her. And, David. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I, it's it, it's not satisfying to be right. Ra- I would much rather be listened to. So, Final point. Um, a final point that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, we spoke a little bit about this before the interview. Um this recent piece that's come out that has said, basically, you don't need to be alarmed about fascism. It's not really happening. And you have a, 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 a uh, you have thoughts that I think really need to get out there about that. Well, I've read these analyses. You know, there are a number of people who have been saying this for a while, including some people I respect. Um but they are always they're always analyzing this from the viewpoint of uh, you know they, they put it in the context of the leaders of so, well Donald Trump's an incompetent and and so he's never going to be an effective fascist and and you know all the you know um, AFD in Germany isn't really fascist and blah 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 and, and what I what I really try to say is that you know the. The, the issue isn't the leaders. It's not Orban and and Putin and Trump that are who, who clearly, you know, they play the role of the authoritarian figures. But that's not what matters in authoritarianism. 
What matters in authoritarianism is the foot soldiers who support them, the millions of people who go out there and, and, and who want an authoritarian leader, who want a Donald Trump, who want somebody who will tell them what to think, tell them what to say, tell them what to believe, because that's how authoritarianism works. And, and those, these are people who, um, you know, that's what I was saying about how fearfulness is really uh, a key to inducing an authoritarian response, where you can get go from 20% of the population having authoritarian personalities to as much as, like, I think now we're, I would say we're in the 35% range in the United States of authoritarianist or authoritarian personalities out there. Um, and yeah, and that's a real problem for democracy. I mean, when you have 70% of the Republican Party believing that Joe Biden was illegitimately elected, that's a real problem. And, and that's how authoritarianism works. It's and they separated. really believe that. They're not just saying yeah. it on the bandwagon to get points with the voters. They actually believe yeah. it. Fully believe it because partly because they were preconditioned over the couple of years leading up to the election by Trump and Fox News into believing that this fraud was going to be taking place. So yeah, um, you know that's to me, and that's what when when we talk about fascist trends in America, um, I don't. I, I think the leaders are kind of a, a play a play obviously a, an important role in that dynamic. But what it tells us whether or not it's happening is what's happening on the ground. And I can tell you when you go out to rural America right now, when you go out to when you go to these excerpts and you go to Trump country, uh, you are seeing very much as a very proto-fascist uh, sort of movement taking hold. I was just spent a week in Boise, Idaho, uh, where which is, you know, uh, is being inundated with people moving in from Southern California, escaping the brown people uh, right now. And uh, it's uh, it's totally transforming that state. Um, I, Wait grew a minute. Up, I grew up in Who's Idaho. Who's escaping the brown people? People in Southern California. I thought the, they were kind of used to the brown people. <laughs> no, 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 no. They they're moving to escape them. Also, you know, and, and just Antifa and, and and the city burners and and you so know, those all these people from are, Southern are California fleeing, are moving out of California, yeah, and moving to places like Idaho. Wow. And uh, yeah, like uh, yeah, really significant increases in in the Boise Valley in the last couple of years, and. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll pay in Seattle, which is the fastest growing large city. Um, and yeah, you, you can't find housing there. But the main thing that I was seeing when I was in Boise was all these people with big pickups, guns in the back rack and uh, flags uh, waving, uh, not just uh, American flags and not just Gazan flags, but uh, Trump flags and fuck Biden flags. So, you know, um, and doing the, brum, 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 you know, rolling coal stuff and, and roaring, revving up their engines and being scaring people in Priuses and, and Subarus. Yep, 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 yep. Exactly. You know, if you, if you had a Biden Harris sticker on your car, you're going to get those guys up your rear grill, you know? I'm sorry, <laughs> but it is terrifying. I mean, I have that going on here. And, you know, when I'm trying yeah. to merge, I'm like, is this guy going to let me in or is he going to run me off the road in this truck? Right. You know, and uh, right. it's, you know. Well, and you're, you're in a state that's on the Eastern seaboard that this is relatively ameliorated. Trust me, go to Oklahoma or go to, no. go to uh, <laughs> Utah or Wyoming or Idaho. And it's overwhelming. And right now, and it's full of people who not only believe that Biden was illegitimately elected, but also now believe they also believe this stuff that's been handed down uh, from right wing extremists and has seeped its way into the mainstream that America is a republic, not a democracy, and that that you know, and it, all of these sort of anti democratic tropes that have worked their way into the mainstream and are fundamentally you know proto fascist, and that's uh, that is what is actually happening on the ground. And the people who are looking at the leaders are looking totally at the wrong thing. They're, they need to see what the conditions on the ground are. And the conditions on the ground in the United States right now are not good. 
Well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank All you right. so much for this very important conversation. David Nyward, investigative journalist. You can find his work well in the bookstores. Uh, the latest book is Red Pill, Blue Pill. As we said, it's just blank pages. The <laughs> I'm just kidding. The antidote to the conspiracy theories that are going right. on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your regular writing is uh, as a staff writer on Daily Kos. So I suggest yes. everyone go over there yeah. and check yeah. out Dave. You can follow him on Twitter where you can see this whole um, line thread that he did that, that we based this interview off at David Nywert, N-E-I-W-E-R-T. Thanks again, David. Appreciate it so much. Always good to be talking to you, Juliana. Take care. You too.